So we are one of the charities that is supported under the umbrella of Health Partners. And I'd like to thank you so very much for being here today, for inviting me to, give a, to, to come in and speak to you, and really um, for the opportunity to have you here, because I know this means that you guys are taking, you know, taking charge of trying to protect your health, which is the first step in everything. A lot of what we heard from Brian um, is very, very much what we know we should be doing, but it's an art form, and it's an art form that we have to work on over time. So by speaking about um, health and challenging everyone to work together, we all work as a team to make ourselves healthier. What I'd like to do is just start with a very uh, brief introduction of Heart and Stroke for those of you who are not that familiar with us. We've been around for over 60 years. Um, we are the number one res uh, contributor of research dollars behind the Canadian federal government. In 60 years, we have put together uh, what we have put towards research dollars, $1.5 billion towards heart and stroke research. And we have learned so many different things. Um, today, we know, um, and these are not the, the brightest figures, but every nine minutes, someone in Canada um, dies from a stroke. Every seven minutes, someone has a heart attack. The one great thing is, part of research dollars has made it so much better that more people are surviving today. For anybody who is having a first time heart attack and who can make it to a hospital, they will survive. 80% of those who are having a stroke who make it to the hospital will survive. But now we have more people that are now living with the after effects of heart and stroke. And that comes to quality of life. So part of our research dollars are not only towards helping us to understand and protect our health, uh, but for those of us that are impacted by heart and stroke, you know, how do we have better quality of life? And so that's where our research takes us next. I'm going to start a bit of a presentation. Um, it's very, very fluid. If you have any questions, je peux répondre en français ou en anglais. La présentation est en anglais, malheureusement, je m'excuse pour ça, mais on peut faire un dialogue en français si vous voulez. So I'll just, is this just, oh, did you, my present, my presentation is on this. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'll keep chatting. Um, <clears throat> and some of this may get a little repetitive, but um, right now, uh, as I've said, more people are living with heart and stroke. So really, our biggest concern is prevention. How do we come and we help work with our community to tell you what we're learning from the wonderful research dollars that you have trusted us with? Um, so really, it's the prevention portion of it. And as Brian said, 80% of the, the markers for heart and stroke can be preventable if we take action. And some of this is just keeping it top of mind. So we're always trying to do better than we did yesterday. Um, and the last part is, of course, the quality of life portion. Um, I'm going to need a bit of my presentation, but maybe I'll, I'll give you uh, some information, um, uh, more shocking information. Right now with heart and stroke, and I see a lot of women in the audience, um, right now heart and stroke is the number one killer of women in Canada. It is the number one killer of women in the world. And the reason for that is that uh, part of our research has, has shown that the women's heart is truly misunderstood. It does not behave like a man's heart. And as much as we've come a long way to understanding hearts and stroke and how to either prevent or to improve quality of life, one thing that we have understood now is that we need to take more action towards women's heart health. And so we have actually, um, there's two things. Right now, research being done through Heart and Stroke, or in the past, any research that was done, two-thirds of the studies were always males. Uh, they were the people that were having the strokes, the heart attacks, um, and so they were done by male doctors, and there was a male slant. Um, through our research, we are now having every research project, and we fund over 860 research projects at any given time. Everything has gender parity. So we have an organization that is simply looking at the women's heart health. So the misunderstood portion of women's heart health is now going to be addressed. So I'll, I'll come back to this. But on our website, if you are interested in reading a bit more, we have our misunderstood um, information, which gives you the latest and the greatest of what we know today about women's heart health. We do know that we are underdiagnosed, we are under um, represented in research studies, and we are under supported, and we are, we are destined to change that. We started last year, we've been actually given $5 million by the Canadian federal government because they trust us with the dollars to try and help address this problem. As soon as we, I'm gonna show you one of our commercials just to kind of drive the point of what we've learned um, in regards to women's heart health. 
So in April, we launched our, our, our uh, Two things that we've learned. Heart and stroke is no longer a disease that affects older people. It's now affecting our young children. This is the first generation that if it continues down the road, it goes down now. It's the first generation that won't outlive its parents. The other part is women. Women's hearts are misunderstood. And the biggest concerns is 53% of, of, of women that are having a heart attack, their symptoms go completely unrecognized. They don't even know they've had a heart attack. Um, the tests that we have been doing in the past, we're now realizing they don't really give us a very good indicator of women's heart health. Um, and the last part is, 20, uh, as I mentioned before, two-thirds of, of clinical research has always been around men. <clears throat> and now heart and stroke is now gender parity with every single thing that we do for, going forward so that we start to understand women's hearts better and really stop women from dying unnecessarily. Uh, so part of our research is now going towards that. As we learn more, we will come out into the community and share more. I do have a bit to share with you of what we have learned with heart, but I'm going to get back to the presentation and I will give you a bit more detail with that in a moment. Ah, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, just this one. Okay, so I, I know you guys, I, what time are you guys here till? Is it just noon? Yeah, about that. Okay, so I'll go a little quicker, but topics for today is just how your heart works. Really what I want, hopefully, that you all leave here today is understanding what are the symptoms for a heart attack and when is it time to call 911. Uh, how the brain works, what are the symptoms for a stroke and when it's time to call 911. Where risk factors are, so where you are in your health, what can you affect, what can't you affect, and what are the small changes that we can make every day that can have really huge impacts on our heart and our brains. So as I mentioned before, every nine minutes someone in Canada has a stroke. Every seven minutes they have a heart attack. Right now, um, everyone knows your heart is a, is a muscle about the size of your fist, kind of fits right under here. Um, it pumps about 100,000 times a day and it's delivering life-saving or life uh, nutrient, oxygen and nutrients to the body. What we find, very simplistically, is after time, and depending on the kind of diet we have, we start to build plaque on the walls of our, our veins. And as you notice, as, the, as plaque builds up and builds up, it kind of closes the walls up. And, the, and so a heart attack can happen when either a piece of this plaque breaks away and gets lodged in the heart, or when oxygenated blood can't get through anymore. So that can cause a heart attack. Some of the signs of heart attack. So these are the general signs that most men, pretty much all men, and most women may experience when they're having a heart attack. They may have chest discomfort or pain, sweating, upper body discomfort, nausea, shortness of breath, and lightheadedness. But what we have gone on to learn is that women do not necessarily present in this way. And so this is the major concern as to why we're losing our mothers, our sisters, and our daughters to heart attack. What we know today is that uh, wi women may not experience any discomfort or pain in the heart area. They may have a very much increased shortness of breath. So, you know, okay, we do, we do our things and we're kind of short of breath, but this would be something above and beyond where you are having difficulty actually breathing um, and it doesn't go away. Uh, you may find pressure or pain depending on how you describe it, because we're all toughies, um, in your lower area. Sometimes it feels like an indigestion. Uh, there's usually a lot of dizziness that surrounds it, lightheadedness, even fainting in women, um, upper back pressure, and it, the extreme fatigue. If you're seeing three, four, five of these different things, it's time to call 911. A lot of women say, you know what, I'm going to go back to bed, I'm probably just coming down with the flu, I've got indigestion, I'm going to feel better tomorrow, if I don't, I'll call the doctor then. The problem is tomorrow doesn't come. So if you have multiple signs, call 911. 
The ambulance attendants let them know what the symptoms are that you're experiencing. They can check what's happening with your heart right away. They have an ECG um, machine that they can hook you up to, and they can tell you right then and there, is this a heart attack? Is this a panic attack? Is it something else? But just knowing that it's not a heart attack is a good thing, because then we know where we are at. If it's a heart attack, they will take you to the hospital. If it's not, they will ask you, do you wish to continue on to the hospital, or are you, do you feel like you're okay? So you don't have to, when we call 911, we are not necessarily saying we're absolutely going to the hospital. We're giving our medical community a moment to see what's going on at that moment in time with your heart, or with your loved one's heart, to see if there's reason to go further. But if you have multiple symptoms, it's something to take serious. If you are concerned at all, talk to your doctors. Advocate, we suggest advocating for yourself. Let them know that you are concerned and that you want to understand better what's going on with your heart. So again, call 911. I'll go a little quicker. Um, so stroke is uh, really an injury inside the brain. So there are two different types of strokes. One where there's actually a blockage. So what happens is depending on where the blockage is in the brain, it will, um, it will impact everything on the other side of the blockage. So it may impact speech, it may impact balance, it may impact a lot of different things depending on um, where it blocks. The other type of stroke is an actual brain bleed. Regardless of what is happening inside the body, knowing the signs of stroke are imperative. Um, and so what we always do is ask you to remember the FAST uh, campaign. So FAST, F stands for face. If you have a loved one, who is all of a sudden something peculiar is going on. Usually the, the number one thing is, is how they're speaking, but I'll start with the F, the face, for now. If you have someone where you're, you know, someone you love, that you don't know what's going on with them, and you're, you, you're curious to know what could be happening, ask them to smile. If when they smile, you know, it's kind of lopsided, you know, it's kind of, instead of going up like this, one side kind of goes down, something to be concerned about. If you ask them to raise both of their arms, up to about here. If they are having a problem, one arm might kind of slide down or kind of go to the side, or they can't bring their arms up. A big concern. If you're talking to them and their speech is jumbled, incoherent, doesn't make any sense, it's time to call 911. There is possibly a stroke happening. Again, same thing. The ambulance attendants will come. We ask that you, you know, give them the, the symptoms that your loved one is experiencing. They will tell you if it's something to be concerned about and whether we need to get to the hospital. But one thing that we've found, our researchers have found, is people who are having a stroke and get to the hospital quickly, one, have less of a chance of a heart attack as well. They have less of a chance of having damage, less damage. But also there are drugs for stroke now that actually stop or even reverse some of the, the impacts of stroke, therefore adding to the quality of life post-stroke. So really understanding heart attack symptoms, understanding stroke symptoms, understanding when it's time to call 911 are the best things to making sure our family and our friends, our loved ones are taken care of. Um, so there are many risk factors for heart and stroke. Some we cannot change. Um, some we can, and so it's really knowing the difference and impacting what you can impact. So the ones that you cannot change are your age, uh, your sex, your family history, and your heritage. But right now, nine out of, nine out of 10 Canadians have at least one risk factor for heart, heart and stroke disease. What you can impact is your diet, how you're eating, how you're choosing to eat. And one thing on our website, it's a um, it's free survey. Um, it's a, a risk assessment test. I recommend that everybody does it, that you pass it along to your friends and your family. What you do is you answer simple questions about your diet, your exercise, your stress level, things like that. It takes about five, 10 minutes. Um, once you've answered that, the system will actually generate an assessment for you and let you know where you are today. But the other part to it is it's actually gonna make suggestions, small suggestions, just small changes that you can make that have a really big impact on your health. So I do recommend you take a look at that. Um, the other is physical activity, staying active, uh, our weight, smoking, stress, and excessive alcohol. Now part of the reason um, that we've brought in, I know that we're all shift work here, and that the priority, I think the priority for shift workers is the same as everyone else. 
It's just sometimes we have to be a little bit more organized in how we do things because you're not necessarily running the, the same timeline as some of your friends, some of your family. So part of it is thinking ahead. How do I make sure that I am getting enough sleep, that I'm taking the proactive steps to making sure I've got the right things in my diet um, and things like that. But as I go through this, it's now as shift workers planning ahead as to how am I going to get there. And really, a lot of this is daunting. I mean, there's so much information at once. But the beautiful part, as Brian said, 80% of what we do can be impacted by making changes. And one small change can have huge impacts. So as much as you're getting a lot of information about what could happen, you can also make very positive changes and positive things so that your heart is protected and that you're less likely. For sure. um, eating healthy. We do um, support the half your plate. Uh, eating your fruits and veggies. So if you look at your plate, we're looking at a smaller plate and half the plate should be raw fruits and veggies or vegetables and fruits. And then the, a small portion of, of meat and cooked items. Being physically active, of course we want to check with our doctor, but we on the whole are suggesting 150 minutes a week of physical activity. Now with shift work, maybe sometimes that's a little bit more difficult, but what we do, what we suggest is finding creative ways. Today people are, and you may even be experiencing it, they're having walking meetings, or they're taking the steps. Maybe you go to a washroom that's one floor up, just so that you get that extra step in. But if you can do 10 minutes, and you do it in multiple intervals, you're already that much better off to helping your heart. Um, maintaining a healthy weight. Part of what we want to do is keep conscious of what we're putting in our mouths, that we're putting the good food in that's going to make us feel good. Because the number one thing that we find is, um, well, I'll, I'll bring it to sleep because I think for shift workers that, I think that's a big one. Would you all agree that that's kind of a, a big challenge? Kind of. I've seen a few nodding heads. Okay, well, part of where I'm going with this is regardless of where you find your challenges, whether it's the way you eat, your physical activity, the amount of sleep you're getting, if one of these items is kind of falling off the map that we're not actually doing what we know we should be doing, everything else kind of cycles out of control. If I'm not sleeping well, I'm not exercising. Not exercising, I'm not sleeping well, I'm tired, I'm going to go to McDonald's and get something to eat. Or I'm going to pick up some fast food just because i got to get something to eat so I can get back home and take care of the kids. And so what we're suggesting is find ways to make sure that you're planning ahead so that you're doing your grocery shopping. As Brian said, planning ahead to maybe making some things and freezing them. Making sure that as you're going home that we're taking time to do that decompress and slowly work our way towards more quiet. Driving home, probably not the best thing to be blaring the rock and roll music and singing to it as you're trying to go home and kind of decompress. So just think of what, what works for you, but what helps you to kind of ease into that sleep mode, it helps you ease into that exercise mode. Maybe it's, I've, got all my, I've always got my gym bag in the car with me. I always know that it's available, and as soon as I have a moment, even if it's only 10 minutes, I'm doing myself a favor. Um, of course, tobacco-free lifestyle. Uh, tobacco is terrible for heart and stroke. Um, it increases your risks by 30% if you are a smoker. Um, so finding ways to cut back or reduce are your best, uh, best uh, things. The beautiful part is when you stop smoking, 48 hours after you stop smoking, your chances of having a heart attack is already decreased. Five years, um, your risk of stroke is nearly cut uh, is near the, near, nearly that of a non-smoker. And 15 years after smoking has been stopped, your risk of heart attack is the same as someone who has never smoked before. So our bodies are really able to heal itself as long as we're giving it what it needs in order to do so. <coughs> Um, managing stress effectively, and, and um, federal government is doing a wonderful job really trying to get into a lot of, um, uh, get groups to talk about not only eating healthy, being more active, but also looking at your stress levels. And it's actually, if, if there's ever any interest, we do do a presentation, a more formal presentation just about stress and helping to what you can do to manage it. What Brian brought forward are great ideas to do something very simply at your desk. But recognize when you're stressed. Stress is an important thing um, as it kind of motivates us to take that next step, to push ourselves ahead and to thrive. Where stress becomes a problem is when it feeds into your life to things that you enjoy doing. If you're starting to think about work while you're enjoying your kids, 
that's when stress is too much. And those are the times that we need to make sure we're reducing those through meditation, um, through relaxation, through exercise. Great way, if those of you like to really exercise, a great way to get rid of some of that stress. Limiting your alcohol use. The one great thing is uh, for women, 10 drinks per week, um, a, a, a four ounce drink, 10 per week permitted. Um, and for men, 15 drinks a week. Now we do suggest that it's not a binge. We don't do 15 drinks all on Friday night, but maybe space it out a little bit so that your body can tolerate. So, so really, um, how we are in action in our community, and I'll kind of wrap it up because I know you're running out of time, uh, but we have, as I mentioned before, uh, put $1.45 billion towards research since 19 1952. We are responsible for advocating on behalf of Canadians. Specifically, you may have seen our um, campaign, The Children Are Not Alright, that we're asking the Canadian federal government to stop companies from marketing to children for heavy, um, like, soda drinks. The reason for that is Kids are having too much sugar in their diets, and right now, children 14 and 15 years of age are on blood pressure medications, and their hearts look like 40 and 50 year olds. That's why we're hearing more about kids having stro uh, strokes or heart attacks on the ice or other places, because of the, the sedentary lifestyle or a diet that's not right. Um, and so these are some of our concerns and what we're trying to do. The other part, lobbying the government for, Can for Canadian women health, and they have, um, Canadian federal government has come back with a resounding support of us to help move the, the marker to make, it, uh, make things better. Uh, the other part you might have noticed, there's a lot of um, um, def defibrillators, AEDs, you've got one here. Um, part of our goal was to get more de defibrillators out there, but we do suggest that defibrillators are not, the, not to replace knowing CPR, CPR is a great thing. But if you don't know CPR and somebody needs help, a defibrillator is never the wrong thing to do. Just so you know, a defibrillator is computerized to do everything for you. You need, you need just turn it on and listen to what it tells you to do. And it will take care of the rest. You might just save a life if you give it a try, if it's needed and you give it a try. It won't shock anybody if they're still got a heartbeat, so don't worry. Um, just how we, um, and, I, and I want to thank you so much because the Canadian federal government allows us to do so many different things with you, including fundraising opportunities. You may have seen us, I think some of you may have seen us on the big bike, uh, which is a 30-person bicycle. It is a fundraising opportunity, but it gives an opportunity for you as a team to kind of come together and do something great for your community. Um, we have lots of people who do uh, things for us to help us continue our, um, to gain knowledge to help fund life-saving research. So we thank you so much for that. And I have gone a bit over, so I'm going to perhaps leave it there. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. I have cards um, if anybody uh, wants any further information. And I'll just say one more thing. Um, we have an opportunity this Father's Day uh, for anybody who wants to do something relaxing with their dad. We have somebody who has offered us um, puppy yoga classes. So it's a yoga class with puppies. Um, it's a great stress reliever. If anybody is interested, please come and see me and uh, we can get you signed up. And again, thank you so much.